Hey. Hey, I'm Donna, and I am a horticulturist, a gardener, a writer, an author. I'm all kinds of things, but mainly a gardener. And I'm here today to answer your gardening questions. And I use as a support for me my own book, obviously, which is the Gardener's Gratitude Journal. It's an action-packed book with lots of stories and information, but it also gives you a chance to record your own note inside the book for three years in a row so that you know when was that first pot tomato picked or when did i get that first potato because every year gardeners are trying to get it better we're trying to get good yes it's true uh i'm ian by the way Hi. <laughs> oh, <here's> ian. <laughs> but ian it's true producer i'm the producer but i'm also the, i'm the voice in the in the void okay i think it's god voice in the back okay maybe not but uh no i was gonna say was uh i've used that myself a lot this summer because we've done a lot of planting it's really really handy there's no way i would ever remember what i've written down yeah and i used to write things down on seed packets or just on the calendar of course at the end of the year you throw away your calendar so this is your guide it's my guide i hope you find it useful because I'm Donna and I'm all about gardening and I'm so glad you joined me here today on our Facebook Live show because action-packed stuff today, I can tell you that. Well, let's talk about that. You were away in Calgary this weekend. Just, yes. Tell us just, why, 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 why? If you saw my bags under my eyes this morning while I was at the airport and the lineup was, oh, suddenly so long, so long that I started to talk to people in the lineup and we'll, we'll get to that later. But I was away and on Friday we did Alberta at Noon, which is the phone-in show, the regular garden phone-in show on CBC Radio in Calgary, but aired across Alberta. And on Saturday and on Friday at Alberta at Noon, I met with Catherine Marlowe. She was hoot. I loved her. She's young. She's I fun. Think she's, she's great. Yeah, she was just coming. She's just in, she said, from Vancouver. So she'd been paying attention to a lot of the things I'd already been saying ahead of time. And she, her and I had a good time. And then on Saturday morning, I went into Global TV and I brought all my big vegetables because we wanted to talk about how you can get kids more engaged in the garden. And one of the things is just to let them go out and find things themselves, like potatoes, digging around the plants. And this time of year, you're starting to get to that point where you can dig around the plants and you don't have to pull up the whole plant. You can just reach in and it's like finding treasure. So kids love that. They also love to pick things that they can eat right away, not things that you have to take in and peel and slice and dice. No, that's too much work. Things like peas that you can eat right away. Kids love that. So we talked about that, how to tell if your cauliflower is ready or past ready. And we just had a great little segment. So go. And you talked about weird looking, um, not spinach. What was the other green? Uh, broccoli, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. She thought it was weird. I mean, if you're used to looking at your broccoli in the grocery store, you'll see it as big heads. But the side sprouts that come after the big heads are amazing. Or you can buy just a sprouting style of broccoli, bypass the whole big head. Because if you're not a big family of five, maybe you have no use for a big broccoli head but you'll have lots of use for those little side sprouts and that's what the chefs like and gardeners we love to love what the chefs love so sure. that was on saturday so we've had lots of good sharing on that too so if you haven't seen that interview with bindu on saturday morning on global we've got it right here on our on our page so go back and have a look at that it's great Liz parsons liz says hi hi liz hey hi liz how are you today got any questions liz liz, liz has got a great garden yes liz have you been out picking your figs yet oh yeah peace Look at these, Ian. Last week, you and I, you were here filming, and we went out and looked and picked one fig, and it wasn't quite yellow yet. It was still green. We tasted it. It wasn't totally juicy. This fig, I just went out and picked. Should I cut it? Yeah, do it. I don't want to cut my son. Oh, yeah. They start to, you know, I they're ready fix. when they start to just hang down from the plant. They hang a bit, but they're still rigid. When they start to just turn yellow and hang down, and look at that. That is a beautiful fig. <laughs> and you can grow figs almost anywhere in Canada if you do special things, like special protection. But on Vancouver Island, if you're growing Desert King figs, you don't have to do anything special. You just have to plant them and grow. Well, you know what? Wendy Bradbury, um, mm -hmm. she says, we've got figs. What does she? Yeah, she says basically she's brand new here on the island. Please tell me what to do. And uh, mm. oh, Ian's eating that one. I'll show you what to do. <laughs> show, show that. That's what you do with them. You eat them, Wendy. <laughs> and you, you know what you do? You you put honey on them and you put parmesan. Ooh, honey, it's all sweet and salty. I was thinking that is what you know. I was eating a lot of that popcorn. Can I have my? Yeah, you can have the rest of it. <laughs> <laughs> so with figs, you shouldn't have to do anything if you're growing the right kind. So if you're growing Desert King, that is the one that reliably comes over winter with the little tiny Breba figs, which are kind of like 
they look like peas in the spring and then these are the ones i'm picking now they're the first crop they're the crop that you don't have to do anything with and so you just have to make sure that they have enough water that they're not dropping leaves i have some that i planted in a pot and they just dried out too much so they're better in a bigger bed or in a garden they probably could use some winter protection but they don't really need it if you're growing on vancouver island sorry about that for everyone else everyone else is keeping theirs in the garage or they're actually digging up and burying the whole plant in the fall but we'll get to that later in the fall all right cool um here's one from crystal lee she wants to know oh no sorry it's carol Krolchuk howard she says what's the one trait that all gardeners share curiosity oh. we all want to know what's next so maybe we're comfortably growing potatoes but we decide hey i want to know how to grow lima beans or i'm really curious now about figs so we're always there's thousands and thousands. i mean we probably only see 25 kinds of plants for sale in the grocery store seriously but there's probably thousands and so as soon as you learn to grow one thing you're moving on to the next thing um there's just ugh, we just want to know things we're curious no that's a good uh, well here's the i'm curious so is carrie lynn who says it's looking like I'll have another bumper crop of green beans if the deer stay away. What's the best way to preserve them? See, she's curious about how to preserve green beans. What? And you, you know, just, I'm a didn't gardener. Just... <laughs> I am not a food scientist, and so <laughs> I don't know how to get them to the point where you pick them. But I do have a friend that's a chef, and so when you're picking them and it's hot, she recommended quickly blanching them, which I do. I quickly steam them, but I didn't know this secret. As soon, and this is what they do in the commercial kitchens, as soon as they're ready, they dip them into cold water right away. That cold water ice bath just basically stops the cooking and keeps the beans green. You wonder why at home when you serve beans, they look brown and mushy. I know you don't do that, Ian. I don't, no. <laughs> but some people do. But the chefs will actually stop it from cooking at the point where it's just started and that keeps that nice dark green flavor so then if you want to make it really great for supper you pull them out they've already been blanched they've already been chilled you just quickly stir fry them with some maybe pine nuts and maybe some shallots and you serve them and they're amazing and a little bit of sea salt and so that's what i would do with serving beans and you can store them in the fridge for a while as well you you know when you buy them at the store they're probably a couple of weeks old and people don't realize that when you pick them in your garden you can store them in the fridge for quite a while so i would do that all and right I, do that. I asked liz if she had a question she does have one so oh. i'm going to post that right on the screen can you see it no yes you can oh, okay. it says well it says my tomatoes are doing really well tons of fruit but my leaves are starting to curl and are dark on the bottom plus they have new spots that don't look good i sent in the pics but i we can't show them, Liz, while well, the broadcast is running, but I will definitely post them in the um, in the thread after we finished. Well, there are some types of blight that get on tomatoes. So, Liz, the leaves that are affected, just go in and carefully pick them all off. Tomatoes always have more leaves than they need anyways. Pick them off. Don't throw them at the base of the plant. Put them in a garbage bag. It seems like picky work, but if we're going to get blight and it often starts with spots, then pick them off. If the tomato, and this is why so many of us grow our tomatoes either in a greenhouse or at least in a small covered area where we just put plastic over top, greenhouse is better. But I know yours are being grown outside because I've seen them. So when you grow them outside, the different things like watering and wind, it spreads the spores of the fungus and you can go from looking perfectly good to being kind of devastated overnight. So it doesn't harm the fruit. You can still pick the fruit. But of course, if you eventually have no leaves, you won't have any more fruit. So I would recommend if you're just starting to get a few leaves with spots, it's probably the start of a fungus and I would go in and pick them off carefully, get them into the garbage and get rid of them. That's what I would do. All right, that's good. So we've had tomatoes, figs so far. What about cucumbers? Uh, Crystal Lee, she says, why are my cucumbers growing super fat and not darkening? I'm a newbie. I left, uh, I left it in the garden for a month to see if it would ripen up. You don't want your cucumbers ripe. That is the It's mistake. super fat and not darkening. Well, they get, they're dark initially and then they get fat and turn yellow. So oh. if you let your cucumbers get too fat or turn you we actually want immatures. Usually we want maturity. We want, you know, the everything that comes with being mature. But when it comes to cucumbers, we do not want to eat those big seeds that are ready to grow in the garden. And that's what happens as the cucumber swells, gets a bit fat. It starts to go from dark green to light green to eventually yellow or especially yellow on the bottom. Honestly, that's not good. You want to pick them before that, well before that. So I pick my cucumbers when they're the right length or when they're starting to turn kind of round, I like them kind of angular almost because those 
young cucumbers are gonna taste fresher. The seeds inside are gonna be very tiny. As the cucumber over matures, the seeds get big and then they are tasting kind of bad. So you don't really want those big seeds inside and the, the cucumber doesn't taste as good. So pick it early, pick often because the more you pick your cucumbers, the more you are going to get, which is really fun. Okay, that's great. I hope, I hope Crystal's happy with that answer. Um, two things from last week. In, right. in kind of ways. Stephanie Lindeberg, uh, you talked a little bit online with Stephanie about the ant traps. Let's talk about the ant trap thing. Right, because we had a call from, um, who was it, Daryl in Fort McMurray, and he was getting lots of little holes in his plants that he was growing on his balcony. And I decided that he probably has flea beetles. And if you have very tiny holes on your plants, whether it's a potato or an arugula, you probably have flea beetles. So I told him he could put out sticky traps and that would catch them because I actually don't want to put out, you know, something like spray. But Stephanie shocked me with her information. She said she's seen birds caught in these traps. That's no good either. We don't want to see birds caught in our traps. Yeah, I was horrified so by I'm those pictures. So I'm withdrawing that, in, that advice to Daryl. <laughs> what he could do, you can get the small stickums, then they go into the plants and they're very tiny and thin. The big um, sticky traps that you might use um, in a commercial greenhouse would just be, yeah, they can catch birds. So I'm not sure how she got those photos because I, I'm not sure how those birds would have gotten in greenhouses and they're mainly used in greenhouses. But anyway, my point is if you have small holes on leaves and you have flea beetle problems, again, a fabric cover might be a better idea for Daryl because he is just growing a small amount on his balcony in Fort McMurray and they are getting big heat waves in Fort McMurray. So Stephanie was right. We will not be using sticky traps. So thanks for that tip, Stephanie. That was online on, on my, um, Facebook feed, yes. Okay, cool. And uh, do you want to talk about your Splendor? Just hold it up real oh, quick. Oh, right, right. So it's just because it's on the <laughs> A couple of years ago, we had uh, somebody phoned me in on CBC and suggested Splenda because Splenda is good to kill ants. And I didn't believe it. I mean, I'm a pretty skeptical person. So yet again, this Friday on CBC Radio in Alberta, someone phoned in about ants and I had to tell them, well, I have used Splenda. And that was recommended by another listener. So I asked an entomologist, is that actually gonna work? Would Splenda work? And he sent me some studies, some of the other kinds of artificial sweeteners, and I don't even know all the brand names, but he sent me the names. Some of those kinds have been tested and found not to work, but actually he did not send me any tests from Splenda. So I researched Splenda a bit further and I realized it has a chlorine on it. And a lot of the toxic chemicals that we use to get rid of insects in the garden have chlorine. So think of it this way, you're drinking coffee, you're putting an artificial sweetener in, and that product actually is effectively useful for killing ants. I don't wanna put it out in my garden because it, honestly, I don't want to kill things unnecessarily but i do have a crack area along my house in between my sidewalk and my house where ants have been coming and going for years and i tried splenda last summer first i swept the area to make sure there was no debris and then i put the splenda down in the crack and it is still effective i've still it's kind of scary actually i don't have any ants in that crack so again i'm sticking because i'm not wanting to use chemicals in my garden and believe it or not splenda is classified as a chemical even though it's sold as an edible food but I don't want to use it in my garden, but I have used it on my sidewalk cracks where I've got a lot of ant activity and now done. So that caller to CBC last year, that was useful. Thank you for calling in and telling us that. And I think that's a good time to point out, we don't know everything. Oh. I've been gardening for 40 years at least. Are and, you serious? I, I was depending on you knowing everything. Oh, I know, but sometimes I would have never, because I don't use artificial sweetener, I would have <laughs> never found out about that but someone called us and same with stephanie called us about the sticky trap so there's lots of things that we are still learning i'm learning all the time same with robin parkinson robin big shout out to you he says my uh i think it's a he my morden centennial rose is stopped flowering what shall i do morden centennial is a fabulous rose and good news is it's not a rose that only blooms once like a hansa rose and then it's finished for the year but what does happen with all flowering plants and we did this deadheading show a few weeks back on little jobs in the garden when you can cut them yeah. back just as the flowers are fading they don't take the energy to put in the seed pods then if you've left them fade and the flowers fall what you're going to find is they will do that they will go to fruit and they figure they're done their job is done so instead it's better to be always out there, whether it's a Morden Centennial or whether it's one of the other new roses, like the Pink Lemonade, which is a new one that I tried um, just recently, I think it was this summer, two years ago. 
as long as you deadheads, that means get rid of the old flowers so that it doesn't have the opportunity to set the seed pods, then it's going to have to bloom again because that plant wants to survive. And that's how it does it. It always produces new flowers. So just get out there and do some deadheading. Cut them back a little bit. Don't worry about cutting the greens back too much unless you have one branch that's going really long. Just cut back the flowers, cut back the end of the stem, and you should have more blooms yet this summer. Sometimes more than centennial will bloom right till November, which on the prairies is amazing. They can tolerate lots of frost and they will keep blooming if you keep them deadheaded. Okay, that's great. I hope that answers your question, Robin. Thanks very much for sending it in. And uh, you know what, Jeannie Adarichin, is that you, Jeannie? I hope I get it right. I'm gonna put your question up. It's a, well, it's not really a question. I think it's a novel. It's long. <laughs> <laughs> we love it though, Jeannie. Let's see what you said. Hi there, love your show. Oh, that's really sweet of you. Uh, this year we had a beautiful greenhouse. BC built and fenced an area for a large oh. garden. Good news is the garden is fabulous, but produce in the greenhouse uh, has been sadly lacking. Has this been a particularly hot year for greenhouses? We've gotten fewer tomatoes, all of varieties, cukes, etc. no eggplants in, uh, at all, until I finally took the plants outside and have a few coming. It is glass versus polycarbonate, mm. but we have shade cloth, the fan running, Etc. is the problem likely just the heat stopping fruit from forming sigh any insights appreciated thanks Jeannie that is great that is a great question Jeannie because actually I have a thermometer set up inside my greenhouse and the fan comes on automatically when it gets too hot here's what happens tomatoes produce pollen and a stigma so the little individual potato, tomato plants have both and in the wild the wind blows and it just caught and the bees visit and it just causes that pollen and the stigma to come into contact hence tomatoes but when it gets too hot or if you don't have any bees or any breeze then you have no way of getting that pollen onto the stigma so you don't get tomatoes so if it's too hot or if the air is too calm so you can actually go in just with your finger or i think we've talked about this before an electric toothbrush and just let it vibrate against those flower trusses that will help the pollen to shed sometimes when it gets too hot the pollen is you probably heard this with guys in the tidy whities the pollen is <laughs> infertile and he is laughing but he's actually kind of squirming it's like no i don't want to hear that but this happens when it gets too hot so then the tomatoes won't set and that's where it's just beautiful to have a fan and i know you said you had one you have shade cloth i do like having the polycarbonate it's like a built-in and already gets some shade and this year i put a 47 percent shade cloth on so check and see what your rating is on your shade cloth but also don't don't worry about getting in there and helping those plants so get in with your toothbrush and help them pollinate the good news is in your greenhouse you're going to have a longer season so even if they're just pollinated now you will find that you will still get tomatoes later this fall so that's what i would suggest because they are pretty fussy and sometimes it's too still not enough bees not enough breeze in the greenhouse all right, Jeannie, that's awesome. Thanks very much. So you're going to BC Greenhouse. That's great. Um, Mike Maxwell, let's see what he says. Mike says... Mike sometimes tweets us when we're on CBC. That's great, Mike. Oh, that's great. Well, he's tweeting us here. No, I heard building an ant motel, a five-gallon bucket with holes in bottom and filled with soil and compost, I guess, works to kill the ants. Is it true? Hmm. You know, ants will go anywhere where they can find food. But why would you want to draw them in? Like, you have to think about that. Why do you want to attract all your neighbor's ants to your house, even if it's to a bucket? I mean, I, I wouldn't want to do that. So I try not to have any of those areas that are dry or that are going to provide food for ants that I'm going to become an ant innkeeper. I don't want more ants than I already have. Ants do play a role and I'm not against ants, but I'm not going to try to draw them in and be an ant innkeeper. So I would say no, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> some people might want to do that, especially if they're doing science studies. Maybe they want to have, I don't know, a little bit of an ant hill at home, a little kind of... <laughs> I love it that you don't want to be an ant innkeeper. Oh, he says to move the ants. Um, oh, you will never move the queen. I think, you know, what people don't realize is that most of the ants in the colony, their whole job is support role. They are not ever going to be mating with anybody or doing anything like having a holiday or anything like that. Their whole job is working. And they, the actual colonies of ants 
have food tasters outside the colonies so that if you try to poison them, they usually are pretty smart at tasting it and dying themselves. So the queen is always protected. So what I'm trying to say is the queen is nowhere near the ants that you are seeing. Even if you were to attract them to a bucket, the queen is not gonna pack up her bags and move into that bucket. And they are not gonna move her. She's quite big, quite sluggish, and usually buried quite deep, sometimes where the soil is warm, so six, seven feet deep and not anywhere near where you see the ant activity happening. So the queen is quite sheltered, quite protected, and pretty big and fat, and not easily able to relocate. So I don't think the queen's gonna be attracted. And as long as you've, um, you know, maybe you're gonna start a new colony, but you're not gonna be able to get that queen so easily moved out of her cozy little haven of a home. So I, would, I wouldn't uh, think that would work too well. But let us know. Again, we were just saying earlier in the show that there are things we don't know yet. It was a CBC listener that put us on to Splenda and Stephanie just now told us about Sticky Traps. So there's always something that we don't know. Even though I feel like I've been doing this a long time, there's always new information. So let us know, Mike, if it works for you. Okay, that's awesome. I want to talk a little bit about Karen from Edmonton. You met her at the airport this morning, <laughs> Monday morning. It yeah. Just this is this about, morning. I love it. This is about garlic and local foods yes can we call it that yeah all right well, let's go. garden so i was standing in this endless line it seemed endless luckily i always go to the airport really early there was hundreds of people and so friendly donna i always get caught up in conversations <laughs> and i found out karen and hi karen if you're there who is a facebook listener she said she was going to edmonton and she told me that she stopped growing flowers and she's only growing vegetables but the one thing she hasn't been able to grow is garlic she gets it at the grocery store it's white and it doesn't look very good to start with she's planted it and it just doesn't materialize so i said to her well that's your number one problem because 80 percent of the world's garlic sold commercially around the world comes from china so already we brought something in from a long ways away and that is not good for the garden secondly a lot of that garlic has been sprayed to inhibit it from sprouting and finally it's just so old it can't grow anymore it's been in storage too long it's dried out so she's been buying garlic to eat because she's had trouble growing it at a local farm at Coleman's in Edmonton and I said to her why don't you plant and here's a couple of heads of my garlic that we dug yeah. up just a few weeks yeah, ago. yeah they're really nice those ones yeah are big. and you'll see that the uh, I'll just show it closer to the camera you'll see that the garlic that you dig has a sort of a purple sheen to it and that is because that is fresh garlic, it's just been dug. So if you're buying garlic at the store and it doesn't have that purple sheen, it is not fresh, it is not local. So go to the local farmer's market. If you cannot grow it yourself, buy locally at the local market or the local farmer's market, and then you're gonna do so much better. You'll be able to take those cloves and plant them outside this fall, breaking them apart, or just enjoy eating them. They're so much fresher and they're so much better for you. All right, that's awesome. And that's good for the garden. That's oh, here oh, ripping in through our subject material. We're going straight <laughs> to learning. I want to talk about this because it's sort of related a little bit. Um, wild foods. I think this is really cool. You made me eat this this morning. Yes, that's right. I didn't really so like is, it. This is um, something that most people don't realize that people love different flavors. We love sweet. We love salty. Okay, everybody knows that. But we love bitter. And only chefs really take advantage of that. Most amateur home cooks, we just use sugar or salt. These are our two things. But chefs will use bitter. So things like celery, if you've never grown celery, this is a couple of days old now, I have it in my fridge. If you've never grown celery, you'll see how dark green it is. So the learning segment today is all about if you're growing your own celery and it gets dark green like this, it's going to be really bitter. And that is one of the flavors that chefs love. They will exploit it. They will find a way to make it good for you. And if you use it, in, especially in your broths, when you're making chicken broth or beef broth, green celery is great. But most of us like the store-bought stuff because it's really pale and it's been blanched. I think Ian blanched when I told him this. No, you know what? It's something I really didn't know anything about. Because you do the same thing with uh, um, asparagus. Asparagus. Oh, well, I don't do it. I, 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 but some people do. Yeah, 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 yeah. So blanched. No, you don't. <laughs> I don't do of course I don't. Uh, but blanched celery is just means that they hide. Yeah. No, I don't do that. It means that you shelter. And sometimes they shelter it by burying the actual plants. And they do this in California. So they kind of drive a tractor along. It buries them in so they do that with asparagus as well. So it covers them up so that they become white or blanched. So when you buy it at the store, it's white, it's not bitter, it tastes good, it's the flavor you recognize from celery. So at home, you're thinking to yourself, well, I don't have that much salt, but then that's something to keep in mind too because that blanched celery is very high in 
bacteria. So it's one of the uh, dirty dozen the foods that are actually can be potentially toxic to you. So at home, I don't want to bury them. I don't want to get extra soil. I don't want to bury them. So what I'm trying, and we'll let you know how it works. We're going to do a little jobs in the garden with this. I am trying burying it or covering it with the, the fabric from my root pouch. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. They, those are the grow bags that I buy that are, well, they were plastic bags. Now they're grow bags for plants because they breathe and air can get in and out. Uh, other people use milk cartons, but I wanted to try it with the with the root pouch fabric. So that's what we're doing. Because even though I love the dark green celery for using and making broths, my family doesn't like it. It. What did you think of it, Ian? I didn't like it. Yeah, it's bitter. And if I was a professional chef and- But I could see your point though. I bet you if you put that in the right place, so in the right amount, if I was a it chef, could be very instance. effective. Yes, because mm -hmm. that bitter in, yeah, as you say, uh, different types of flavors and association with other types of things, take on different characteristics mm -hmm. but it's it's quite it's it's quite uh, uh what's the word tangy pungent. yes yeah yeah, yeah. you so, really know you're tasting something <laughs> so anyway i'm just saying uh the learning segment this week is that if you are growing celery and it's the first time you've ever grown it you are going to know it's going to be dark green compared to what you see at the grocery store if you don't like that look you can blanch it either with soil or with a cover. So we'll cover that more further, you know, further along as we get through the little jobs in the garden, which we like to film here every week and show to you on Wednesday mornings. If you haven't seen them, we're thinking about posting some of, reposting some of them because they're fun and we've started putting them on YouTube as well. Oh yeah, that's a very yeah. good point. You can see these mm -hmm. on YouTube. Um, more questions, Cindy Schroer Trottier. Actually, she might, doesn't really have a question, but she's got a comment. She says she's got uh, 18 separate heads on her sunflowers. And we haven't talked about sunflowers this yeah. summer, but no. sunflowers are a summer kind of flower to me. Well, they're an annual. Sunflowers are an annual. They come up in the spring from a seed, a really large seed, and then they grow up. And usually they're bred to have just one big head. They're breeding so many new kinds now, like with every other plant, like with tomatoes and potatoes. There's so many kinds of sunflowers. Some of them are actually branching, and those are the ones used by the florists because the florist doesn't want to put one honk and sunflower in your arrangement because there won't be room for anything else. So they've been breeding these new kinds of sunflowers that have multi stems. So maybe you bought one of the specialty types of sunflower that they're designed to use by florists or maybe flower farmers. Because 18 so heads is a lot. That is a lot of heads and, and maybe it's a natural mutation. Normally, as I say, sunflowers, uh, the ones that most people buy just have a single head. So either it was a, a seed that got sort of accidentally into your batch of seeds or maybe you deliberately bought a specialty cut flower style of sunflower and that's great i mean they'll still produce the flowers and still get the seeds one caution and it was a farmer that told me this why i feel like i learn new things every week sunflowers whenever her husband sees them in her vegetable garden because they used to grow them commercially he warns her to take them out i thought why would he do that and she says he doesn't like sunflowers in the vegetable garden and now i've looked it up and they are allelopathic that is a tongue twister oh good word allelopathic so sunflowers as they grow will give off a chemical to stop other things from growing we did talk about this with cauliflowers they are also allelopathic in cabbages so it's kind of a cool word and sunflowers are that way too so if you're really having a bumper crop and they start to seed all over and you also want to have a vegetable garden just be a little bit cautious because they do want to take over your garden and your soil so give them a spot and leave them in that one spot okay that's awesome um this is your one minute warning we're almost there what what i'm going to give you you can talk about anything you want for 60 <laughs> seconds <laughs> well i have to say i have had a lot of fun traveling. I was this month alone, I was in Cranbrook, I was in Calgary, and I was visiting all kinds of different gardens and talking to different people, including Donna. I hope you're following this Donna Shafe. I was at her garden yesterday. Gardens are always evolving and growing. And if you're somewhere in between keener, new gardener, or older established gardener, know that there's, it's a kind of a gray area. You can always be improving your garden. You can always be fixing it up. You can always be renovating. It's not like a house that you decorate and you are done. With the garden, there's always some evolution there. And I want people to just have fun with it and just grow it. And I also want to say, we've got an update on my watermelons from last oh, year. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Last week's little jobs in the garden. I was away for only four days. And when I came home, my little tiny watermelon that was left after my deer debacle, 
that one was left. I had lost my biggest watermelon. My little tiny watermelon is now this big. It's almost ready to pick. Now, I'm going to be turning to the professionals, that is the commercial watermelon people, to find out exactly what day it's ready to pick. And tomorrow I'll take a picture. I'll post it right here on our Facebook Live. And you can see in four days how my teeny tiny watermelon has become a really sizable one. And that is because we put the deer covering on it last week. No more losses to deer. I went uh, boldly forward with that. Good point. And if you want to see how Donna protected her melons against the deer, you can check out last week's Little Jobs in the Garden. And please share it with your friends. I think you're here with me now, but so many people aren't. So the Little Jobs in the Garden kind of can have a life of their own after the show. And we post them every Wednesday morning. Do we want to get a clue what we're posting this week? uh yeah you can say strawberries how to improve and spread your strawberry patch yeah and pruning grapes and pruning grapes because if you want your crops to ripen up better whether it's tomatoes or grapes you have to prune them it seems like a weird time to prune but we're covering both of those topics this week wednesday morning eight o'clock little jobs in the garden thanks for joining me today i'm donna balzer oh and i want to say hi to neil thomas hi neil hey hi neil <laughs> thanks so much for joining us take care